Well, good morning. Still, still morning here. Uh, it's a little cooler outside today than yesterday, so I'm not going to be outside uh, today. Um, this will be our last study for uh, this week, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the studies from the, the book, and I hope that these videos are of some asset to you in those uh, studies. Today in your Bible study, we won't go through the whole thing, uh, but you'll find a chart there of several uh, scriptures for actually um, that the author wanted us to uh, look at and get our get our thoughts about. Um, and in the first one, we're going to hear Paul uh, speaking to Timothy. Basically, you might say speaking from his deathbed. He's not sick. But he was about to pay the ultimate price. Uh, at least most historians, um, scholars, theologians uh, think that this was Paul's final letter and that he died uh, not long after the writing of it. There are other opinions about that, but we won't go into that today. The words that Paul uses uh, in the text that's given to us are, are strong words. The whole letter is, is strong, and it's an encouragement for Timothy to um, be faithful, continue to be uh, faithful. Uh, and here in chapter 3, 2 Timothy uh, 3, Paul, Paul is, well, you, you'll see in, in what it says, it seems like he's bragging, but he's not. He's, he's not saying, look at me how great I am. He's It's more... Uh, he, he's describing a, a life of sacrifice. Paul is not looking to put himself forward as to so as to get a better rank in, in Christianity or a better rank than uh, whomever. Uh, he's, he's describing a life of sacrifice that Timothy could testify to because Timothy was there with him. Uh, but it was sacrifice, and this is something else that Timothy would have seen, and Paul is simply reminding him of that. It was sacrifice uh, with a passion, not as a chore. He didn't say, he did, it wasn't that, well, I'm a Christian, so I have to do this. It, he, he wanted to do this because of his love for God, because of his love for his fellow man, a love which he learned from God. And it's not something that, uh, you know, when Paul was Saul of Tarsus, if I can be judgmental uh, uh, on this, and this, you can correct me if I'm, wrong, or if you think I'm wrong, Paul was being religious as a chore. He had to to do this. Now it's because he's learned better. He's learned the way of Christ. He learned through uh, a better interpretation of what God was doing in the Old Testament, what was required of the Jews in the Old Testament. Now it's not a, well, I have to keep the rules bop, 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 in order to uh, get to heaven. That's That's a legalistic system that you have to deserve your salvation because of the things that you do. Paul is t telling Timothy, no, it's not like that. Paul wanted to do this because of his love for God, a love uh, that he was responding to. Um, Paul teaches us in another passage that, you know, God first loved us, and it's because of that love, that demonstration of love that he made to us, that we respond in love to him. And as we respond in love to him, we learn to love like him. And that's the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your fellow man as yourself. Those are the two commandments on which hang all the law and the prophets and on which hang uh, the New Testament teaching. And that's the mentality that you and I have to learn. If we're going to be faithful in Christ Jesus, not just faithful churchgoers, but if we're going to be faithful in Christ Jesus, we need to develop this mentality just like Paul did, and just like Paul is trying to encourage in, in, in Timothy. Now, most of us, we've been handed a, handed down a religion from our uh, forefathers, and that's, I don't mean to say that is a, a bad thing. It's just, it's not enough. Our faith must be must come to involve the words that Paul uses here in this text, and we'll get to that in just uh, a moment. And that faith that comes from those kinds of words or comes from involving those kinds of words in our life, it, it doesn't happen by accident. It happens when we passionately are in love with our Messiah, with our rabbi, because of what he has done. It happens because we see that his way 
not just his religious values or his religious rituals, but his way is the only way, is the, the true way. It happens when we see not only what he did, but why he did. And then we adopt and pursue that course for our own lives. Because it's our response to God demonstrating such magnanim mag mag such great love, <laughs> magnanimous love uh, for us. Uh, we can't I don't know how to say it. It's, it's it's our response to God is because we understand what he did and why he did. And it's not a religious response. It is a life response, a change of life values uh, response. And it ends up being um, demonstrated in our love for other people, even when that love for other people requires sacrifice. That's what God did. And that's what he calls us to be. So I ask you, as we look at this text, to read Paul's words with, with that in mind, to read them uh, with the purpose of growing to be like that, because that's what Jesus was, and that's what Paul wanted to be, and that's what he was encouraging in Timothy, that's what he's encouraging in, in Mike and in, in you. If, if we want the Blue Ridge Church to grow, and I passionately do, I would not have come to Blue Ridge if I did not want the, the Blue Ridge Church to grow. I'm, I'm not a preacher who just takes a job because it's a job. I took the last job I took because I wanted that church to grow. I wanted it to become a people who were like Christ or like Paul, who was like Christ. And if we want the Blue Ridge Church to grow, and I'm not necessarily talking about numerically, that'll be a great blessing if that happens. But if we want to grow in spirit, we're going to have to passionately be involved in the way of Christ, not just be passionate about our religion, but passionate about our our faith. And I, I think there, while there are some similarities in the, those words and how we understand those words, there are some differences too, and we need to come to understand that. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 10. But you, Timothy, have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life. The word there for manner of life is the, the leading of my life, the path that I walk. You have carefully followed, looked at, watched my the path that I walked. You have carefully followed my purpose. The word is prothesis, I, uh, uh, how I stood, how uh, what was important, what I put forth in my life as being important. Paul could have put, put a lot of things. If he remained religious like he was as a Jew, he could have put forth a lot of things as being important. But he rather put his whole life in Christ, and that, the way of Christ, was what he put forth as, as, as important. So he says, you have carefully followed my doctrine, the teaching, my manner of life, the path that I walked, and the purpose uh, I, the, the, what I put forth as most important, my faith, my long suffering, um, the to compound word meant there meaning my long passion. There's a couple of words translated as long suffering in the New Testament. And uh, this one is um, long. This is my own uh, putting the Greek into the English translation. Uh, long passion, how I suffered long. Um, I, I, I put up with a lot that came against me because I wanted to be like Christ. I wanted to love the people, even the people who were persecuting me. I wanted to love them like Christ loved them. You've watched that, Timothy. You, you've seen that. You've seen my love. This is a familiar word to you. It's the word agape, taking care of others' needs first, uh, regardless of the sacrifice that's uh, required. That's the same love that God had for us. And Paul says, you've seen that in me. You've seen my perseverance. Hupomone is the Greek word, endurance. But James uses that word a lot. You've seen um, my persecutions. I have a very limited knowledge uh, of, of Greek, the same knowledge that most anybody can have with a uh, Greek lexicon. Uh, I, I'm not proficient in Greek. And so this word here, in my limited knowledge of Greek, it, it, it's a puzzle uh, to me. The best I can do is uh, describe it 
to describe it is to say it, it speaks of a of a servant who was beaten, a servant his, who is pursued or or chased in an aggressive uh, manner. You've seen how I have been pursued uh, as as a slave or as a servant uh, in my faith. You've seen my afflictions is the next word that he gives us. That it's there. The word is like emotional uh, sufferings. You've seen the emotional sufferings that I endured because of my faithfulness to the way of Christ. He speaks of specifically what happened to him at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I carried, I endured, I carried as a burden. And he says, uh, out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. And I don't think Paul is saying something different about the one he's going through now. He's in prison, he's going to die, but he knows the Lord will deliver him. The 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 uh, letter ends up with him saying, "The Lord, the righteous judge, will give me that reward." Uh, so he he knows he's going to be delivered, not physically this time. He's going to die, but he still will be delivered, and that's Paul's encouragement to him. But <laughs> don't give up, Timothy, because uh, the Lord will deliver you, either physically out of that situation in which you might be, or spiritually, uh, eternally, uh, or both. Um, well, not both. Uh, if he dies physically, uh, then he will not have survived that burden or that, that persecution uh, in a physical sense, but God will have will reward him spiritually. And that, that's the promise of the book. Uh, he says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. And there's the key. I think um, if we can get a key here that's it for us those who desire to live godly in christ jesus not those who religiously do things because they're christians but those who live godly in christ jesus they will suffer persecution not suffering persecution not going through trials maybe we need to consider are we living godly in christ jesus or are we just being religious are we just putting church of christ on our sign out there and saying that we're christians there's so much more here that Paul is trying to describe to Timothy and to us in living godly in Christ Jesus. So again, I ask you to see these words, to, to, to hear these words as something Paul chose to take upon himself and why uh, he chose that. And that's the key point. I, I Maybe I don't do a good job at explaining it as uh, Paul would have to uh, Timothy, but he, he wanted what Jesus gave to him to be given to others and his life with persecutions would would accomplish that. It's the means by, by which God would accomplish uh, that. And Paul saw it uh, that way. So Paul just didn't just religiously go to church. That's not the apostle Paul. And that's not what he's encouraging in Timothy. It's not what he's encouraging in us. Should we go to church? Have we used the term go to church? Sure, there's a reason for that. And the Hebrew uh, letter you know, specifies that uh, that the assemblies are uh, important to our, our Christian life so that we can be provoked to these love, to this kind of love and, and, and good works. But our faith is demonstrated in how we live uh, this world, not just being not bad people, but being godly people and good people in the sense that the Bible uses the term. Well, Paul's letter to Timothy was to, again, encourage him, to strengthen him for what Paul believed or knew would be Timothy's future if he maintained a passion uh, for Christ, for the way of Christ, to live godly in Christ Jesus. Peter, uh, his letter is similar, in, uh, but it's addressed more to the church at large, or more members of the church, not just Timothy, not just one single person, but to the church at, at large, who actually was undergoing persecution. He encourages them to, to stay the course, to bear that cross, as we've talked about this week, to because the future of the church in, in, in this world is dependent upon how we bear that cross. If we don't bear that cross, uh, the next generation uh, won't get it. The next generation may get our religion handed down to them, but they won't get the faith. They won't get the godly in Christ Jesus and why and what that means. Our suffering, when it's called for, 
is the sacrifice, or at least a part of it, that we make because of our calling and those for whom uh, or who will follow after us. We we need to keep the faith alive, and that's done by our suffering when necessary, not going out there and calling suffering to come upon us, but when it's re required, when it comes upon us, we suffer as a sacrifice for the benefit of those who will come next. First Peter 4, verse 12, beloved family, loved ones, do not think it an odd thing, strange, concerning the fiery trial, which is to, to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that we are partakers in Christ's sufferings. Rejoice. That's really a strong word there when you're thinking about suffering as a Christian. And in, in response to that, not getting mad at God or getting mad at those who might persecute us, but rejoice to the extent that you are, may partake in Christ's sufferings. We are only continuing what Christ started. Uh, and, and remember in, in this idea here why Christ suffered. He suffered for 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 others. James will uh, teach in his letter uh, that we can personally grow, and Paul does as well, but we can personally grow from um, our sufferings or the trials that come upon us. So there is that part that we can become stronger ourselves, uh, but our suffering, whatever trials or persecutions might come our way, is also for the future for the benefit of those who come, who are our contemporaries or who will come after us. If we don't suffer, if we compromise in a time of trial instead of uh, stand fast or take what um, comes to us in the name of Christ for the purpose of Christ, then Christianity, salvation doesn't go to the next generation. Religion might be handed down, but faith True faith, godly in Christ Jesus, as Paul used the term, it is not handed down. Rejoice in, to this extent that you partake in the sufferings of Christ, that when his glory is revealed, revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I, I wish I could fathom for myself <laughs> what that means. Uh, 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 I, if I could understand it better for myself, I'd, I could explain it better to, to you. But just the thought of it, the words, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you when you are reproached for the name of Christ. You're blessed. Maybe the world doesn't see you as blessed, but you are blessed because the Spirit of God rests upon you. The, the uh, Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, that is the persecutor's part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. I don't suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's affairs. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Verse 19 he says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, not just suffer, because a lot of times we suffer the consequences of our own sin, but let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good, beneficial deeds, not just being good, but in doing good, doing things that benefit other people uh, as, to a, as to a faithful creator. In the third reading, we have listed for us in Philippians chapter 3, we have Paul describing uh, what he gave up and what he exchanged it for. Before he, he met Jesus, Paul was, as Saul of Tarsus, he was on his way up the ladder. and He, he wasn't just on the first rung or two. He was way up there. He had already uh, achieved much in uh, his life as a, uh, as a Jew in, in that environment. And he, he was way up there as the world perceives way up there. The text, this text is more about what Paul personally gained uh, in, in Christ than it is about what um, we might gain from him. Uh, it, it's not so much about his suffering for others, although it's, that's not involved. But it's more about how he personally was benefited because he endured, uh, because he sacrificed all of that that he now counts as done for what he has gotten in Christ Jesus. And again, I ask you to see not a man whose chore it is to live a Christian life, to go to church and 
not do this and not do that and do this and do that uh, because that's what's on the list that I have to do or not do. Uh, but I ask you to see this as a man who whose passion it is to to chase after Jesus, the living and eternal Son of God. Philippians 3, verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all these things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and now count them as rubbish, uh, a manure pile, uh, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, you did good, 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 but having the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Folks, when we live godly in Christ Jesus, we will be seen as righteous, not because you have done uh, good things, because you are more righteous in the world's term, using that term, than anybody else, but because we have the righteousness of God, righteousness from God. And he says, I, I do this that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, know the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, not that I have already attained, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, I continue that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Powerful, powerful words when we uh, understand them and uh, apply them. Very quickly, 1 Peter 5, uh, beginning in verse 8, the last reading, uh, he, he says, be sober. That's the word, uh, don't be drunk. Uh, uh, but the idea and application is don't be duped like a drunk might be. You can, <laughs> uh, a man who's drunk, you can convince him of a lot of things. Uh, and uh, <laughs> they make up a lot of tales or a lot of things are exaggerated when you hear the drunk tell about what happened, an event that what happened. Well, he's uh, allowed the alcohol to to so change his uh, understandings that he makes up tall tales. Don't be deceived. Don't be drunk and duped and by context by Satan, but rather be vigilant. Uh, stay awake. Because your adversary, this is not the little guy with uh, red horns and a red pointy tail and a red pitchfork. This is the devil, Satan, the beast, the dragon. He is your adversary. He's the one who wants to destroy you. And he walks about like a, a roaring uh, lion, seeking whom he may not play with, but devour. These are strong, strong words that Peter is trying to Help us understand. Resist that beast. Stand against him. Uh, be steadfast in uh, the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He's going to come at you, and he's going to come hard against you, and he's going to pressure you to give up. But stand fast. Don't be duped by his lie. If you compromise, the world's not going to love you more, uh, and you're going to lose your eternal uh, salvation. Don't be duped that uh, everything will be good and hunky-dory if you just uh, compromise, resist him, stand fast in the faith, knowing that others have done so uh, as, as Christians, as godly men in Christ Jesus, they have uh, experienced much pain, much suffering, and much glory because of it. Verse 10, but you, but may the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, offer you, uh, after you have suffered a while, perfect you, refresh you, establish you. That word is, uh, think about setting a, a post in concrete. Uh, if you, I set a post in um, uh, gravel one time, and you, you, you hit it, and it just kind of falls over. It just goes with the, the gravel. You set it in concrete, uh, <laughs> And it's, you hit it, you've hit something. Be like that. Be established like that. Strengthen. Uh, after you have suffered a while, uh, perfect, establish, uh, strengthen. Give bodily vigor uh, is the Greek definition or the English definition of that uh, Greek word there. Uh, sort of like uh, with steroids, where our, our body uh, is invigorated by the, the steroids only without the uh, bad side, of, side effects. 
uh, may the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect you, establish you, invigorate you, strengthen you, settle you. The word settle there uh, is sort of like the word established um, there in the earlier part of the, the verse to settle you in a, in a firm place. It's the same word that Jesus used uh, when he spoke of uh, being founded upon the rock rather than upon the sand. Uh, may God settle you, found you uh, in that way. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's so much to learn, so much that I have to learn about being uh, a disciple of Christ. Being a disciple of Christ uh, means doing good, being good, uh, shunning uh, evil and uh, following righteousness. But here in this context that we're speaking of uh, today and this week, it's, it's also about enduring suffering when the world uh, is against you because of your faith in, in Christ, because you live godly in Christ Jesus, Satan's coming. He's coming against you and he's going to come hard and he will persecute you. And he, he, we need to so passionately follow Christ that we don't allow, allow that persecution, that suffering, whatever it might be to change who we are. And rather, as Peter says here, be perfected, established, strengthened, settled, uh, by God himself. I hope that's who you are. I hope that's what God is doing in your life because you are standing fast, resisting uh, the devil. That's God's promise here in this text. That's God's promise uh, to you. Don't give up. Don't forsake. Don't wobble. Don't try to straddle a fence. Don't uh, give God an hour a week and on, on Sunday, but give him your life. Passionately give him your life. And you will see that God is working in your life, perfecting you, establishing you, strengthening you, settling you. And I hope that's who you are. I hope that's who I am. I hope that's who we can be. I hope we can leave a mark in Blue Ridge that will cause the church to be here for centuries to come. You look at some of the uh, churches that are written to by Peter and uh, Paul and and. Uh, others in the New Testament, then they're gone now. They're not there. Somewhere along the line, um, those churches weren't being what they needed to be. Uh, and Jesus speaks of that in the uh, book of Revelation when he writes the seven churches of Asia. Um, if we want this church to continue, and that want has to be a, a, a passion a passion for the souls of other people, a passion for God. Yes, we need that first. But that passion for God turns into a passion for other people because that's who God is. We respond to God because of the love that he has for us. And that response involves showing that same love for other people, even at a sacrifice. And sometimes that sacrifice comes in the form of suffering persecution. Um, yeah, I said enough, I think. Um, I hope that uh, this is helpful in your studies. Hope this is helpful in your Christian life and, and in mine, May. Uh, God bless you in your studies. See you. Well, today is uh, Friday. Uh, if you're watching this on today, tomorrow is the pig out day. I hope we get to see you tomorrow uh, at, at the pig out and then again on uh, Sunday. Talk to you later.